Whenever a movie about slavery or the story of black pain in the United States comes out, there is this part of the black internet that says that they are tired of movies about slavery and black pain. Recently, with the release of The Trash That Is Antebellum, this, is, this has come up again. And I feel like we need to actually have a discussion about the slave movies that we have gotten and how little they have actually done to educate black people about the institution of slavery. And yes, I said specifically black people. One thing I think is often sort of ignored is that black people have not historically been taught the history of their enslavement. And when it comes down to it, there are like two kinds of black people in the world. Ones who are descended of child slavery in the Americas in some way and those who are not. And yet movies about our ancestors' reality are actually not as bountiful as you would think, and we actually have not had a really good education in teaching other Black folk what that looked like and what the intricacies of being an enslaved person was like. <laughs> Because of the Hayes Code, which ran from 1934 to 1968, major motion pictures could not make films that depicted slavery in a negative light because these films had to be shown in the South and therefore they didn't want to alienate their Southern audience by making movies that depicted slavery as a horrible institution. This is why for the most part when you have movies that touch on slavery, any sort of Talking about slavery as wrong is usually done in subtext and not the text itself. You know, the biggest movie that depicts slavery that's ever been made in the United States is probably still Gone with the Wind, and that is an issue. I'm specifying major motion pictures and major studios because those are the films that we really talk about when we say that we're tired of like slavery movies or black pain movies. We're looking mostly at major motion pictures, not independent films, not films that have been made by smaller presses, because if we were, we'd be having a different kind of conversation. If we were to grab the films that are really about the lives of enslaved people that are not miniseries or made for television movies or documentaries, I would say of the good ones, the ones that people cite and reference, we probably have maybe a dozen? Slim pickings to say the least, but if we're going to talk about the big ones we would be talking about 12 Years a Slave, Beloved, Amistad, Birth of a Nation, Harriet, and there would be a few other films where slavery is in the film but not really the premise of it. The quality of these films is all over the place and most of them are really centered around the tragedy and exploitation of everything having to do with black folk, but have very little to do with the humanity of what it meant to be an enslaved person. In general, movies about slavery are a drop in the bucket when it comes to black cinema. We just got a movie about Harriet Tubman last year, despite how you may feel about it. The reasons why these films get so much attention is because they are almost by default set up to be prestige films. You can't just make a movie about slavery without bringing some weight to it, some gravitas. I don't think we're gonna have our own Jojo's Rabbit anytime soon, unless you're Quentin Tarantino. But even Django was a multiple Oscar nominated film, although all those nominees were for white people. Sadly, films about racism, queer longing, and being a tragic, marginalized person is like butter on a roll to cinema. And because of that, independent films about black joy, comedies, and romances are just not always on the radar of a lot of people. Pain gets a reaction. Tapping into a collective trauma gets a reaction. And with that, promotion, marketing, and a name for yourself. Sometimes to make Creed and Black Panther, you have to also make Fruitville Station. And because of that, unfortunately, we do have a lot of hyper focus on these films. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but I think that because we have a hyper focus on movies about slavery when they do come out, because they come out for Oscars, you know, because movies about racism, even if they're bad, people will be like, wow, really makes you think, huh? That's how Green Book manages to win awards. But I will say this, to quote my girl Hannah from Twitter, watch more movies. Sometimes it requires us making a little bit more effort to see beyond the Tyler Perry, the Kenya Barris. You know, there's a lot of actually great black content across the diaspora being made, but we who are looking for it sometimes need to just actually 
look for it in our libraries on YouTube. And as for recommendations, I will put some of my favorite black cinema down below in the description box because we could all use some better help figuring that stuff out. But when we do get these movies about slavery, so often they are shallow at best and traumatic at worst. For every movie that, while imperfect, that attempts to bring humanity to the lives of enslaved people, there are films that are making stories about slavery solely for the gaze of white people. Which brings us to... What are we doing? Spoilers for Antebellum, just in case it was a movie that you wanted to watch. Antebellum is a horror film written and directed by Gerard Bush and Christopher Reynes, starring Janelle Monet as Veronica, a writer and renowned sociologist who is kidnapped along with many other Black people and brought to a Civil War reenactment theme park where white people, mostly men, get to brutalize black people including rape, murder, and torture. Eric Lang plays the senator who runs the place and Jenna Malone plays his daughter Elizabeth who is serving prime stormfront energy. Yes, I have been watching The Boys. I just finished binge watching it. I have thoughts. Within the first few minutes of the film when you see a black woman being lynched, with a septum piercing, you can tell that this is not an actual period drama. The twist is pretty much on the nose and it kind of comes through about halfway, 40 minutes into the movie. And I don't actually think it was a twist because I thought the trailers made it clear that that was what was happening, but maybe that's just me. The film was created by two men, one white and one black. And for me, the thing about the film that stuck out is that Antebellum seems so in love with its concept that it actually participates in the dehumanization of every black character that is not Veronica. So as I was editing, I just realized that I wanted to say one more thing. Um, I don't, I just like how the movie seems to imply that only exceptional black people can be leaders for black change. I think that it's a very counterproductive message to tell descendants that there is something flawed in us being, it, it, it implies that there is something about our enslavement that is, that was our fault, that if we had just knew how to ride horses, we would just been out that bitch. And I think that that is troubling to me. And the older I get and the more research that I do into this topic and the subject matter, the more I'm just like, part of what happens when you choose like a Solomon Northrup or, you know, this fictional character or even a Harriet Tubman movie is that there is this desire that comes from a filmmaking language to make it like a hero's journey to highlight the things about that person that made them exceptional and i think you know harriet tubman was an exceptional woman in many ways but i think that the disservice comes where it's like well anyone else that wasn't doing that was like a coward there's a there's a scene where like another um woman she goes to veronica and is like you just you know you're the house girl and you're doing and i'm just like girl this is so that was just such a silly scene and uh, of course it's written by two men and i'm just like all of this implies that inherently people who didn't try to escape were weak part of what we need to do as descendants and those and those who are not is to really decolonize our minds of this idea that like slavery was a punishment for our inherent ills or like we were just not good at you know what I mean like it, slavery as it existed in this part of the world was not because we were weak it was not because we weren't good enough to, to stop our enslavement. Institutional power, institutional control, white supremacy is powerful. It is more powerful than soldiers. The enslaved people need to be the focus because we know that the institution of slavery is corrupt and people who don't know that are not going to be changed. Like if they didn't learn from 12 years of slave, if they didn't learn from all these other experiments that they had to do, then there is nothing that we can do about it. It's just the way it is. Our investment right now as Black folk is when we make movies about slavery, are we humanizing 
our ancestors? Are we creating bridges between them and ourselves? Or are we distancing ourselves from them by trying to insinuate that what went on with them was in the past when everything that we deal with today and how our culture operates today is because of what they went through? Not to say that Get Out was realistic, but at least with body snatching, the person still exists. There's a body that can go on and living. You know, with Antebellum, they are not only kidnapping and murdering Black people, but in the case of Veronica, who is renamed Eden by the Eric Lang character, she's a prominent Black writer and talking head on CNN with a lovely melanated husband and child and friends. And the whole operation just seems really reckless and silly and destined for failure. And maybe that itself is trying to make some larger point that the whole institution was just destined to fail because they happened to take one exceptional black person. Even that doesn't really feel earned. It feels like a cop-out. In the original ending of Jordan Peele's 2017 horror hit Get Out, the lead character Chris, played by Daniel Kaluuya, after escaping the body snatching white folk, was arrested and charged with murder of several white people and is seen in jail at the end of the film. That ending tested terribly and was changed to the more uplifting version where after we see those police lights, it's not the actual police, but the best friend, TSA agent, Rod Williams. Love him. I mean, I told you not to go in that house. And it was that kind of choice that allowed Get Out to be social commentary, funny, horrific, without being voyeuristic uncomfortable and triggering. Antebellum falls under the same track that I think a lot of people get is that they're so often wrapped up in wanting to have this narrative be a come to Jesus moment for white people. We're teaching the brutality of slavery. We're teaching the darkness of, of white supremacy. And that's good, yes, but they fail to understand by doing that, that they are centering the white audience not the black one. This isn't to say that there aren't black people who need to be educated about slavery. Kanye has proved this time and time again. But even in that, we spend so much time turning everything into, into caricatures so the audience won't accidentally turn someone into a white savior that we deny the opportunity to highlight the tenacity and bravery and strength of enslaved people and how it connects to us today as descendants of that institution. I'm T.S. motherfucking A. We handle shit. As I've gotten older and coming into my blackness in a new way, not just as the lived experience as a black woman, but also as part of this living, breathing, organic continuation of life, it has become important to me to ask myself what I know about the path that has led me to this place in my life. I very much remember being taught about slavery in a way that made it feel like shame. And then as someone whose slavery took place outside of the United States, as I entered my 20s and really sort of thought about the differences, I realized that I had really no idea of what slavery looked like outside of this lens. What slavery looked like besides the pain. That might seem silly because it was horrific, but the reality is that Black people from the Americas, we are all here because someone survived torture, someone survived brutality, someone survived those ship rides. I exist because someone existed in some of the worst human rights violations that ever take place on this earth. That is a legacy that I don't think that we see tapped into enough in film. It exists in books, plenty in books, plenty of novels across genres have been really excellent at touching, at touching on this. But when it comes to film, we don't really get to see that. We are not separate from our enslaved ancestors. We are continuing their legacies. Jamaica Kincaid once said, For isn't it odd that the only language I have in which to speak of this crime is the language of the criminal who committed the crime? And what can that really mean? For the language of the criminal can contain only the goodness of the criminal's deeds. The language of the criminal can explain and express the deed only from the criminal's 
point of view. It cannot explain the horror of the deed, the injustice of the deed, the agony, the humiliation inflicted upon me. We need to reframe how we film these movies, how we write them, to not just use the film language that says prestige. We have really forced films to be sorrowful in order to be moving, and I think that is what leads to the voyeuristic way of telling slave stories. And it does more harm than good to Black audiences who have lived with this pain generationally. Are there moments where it's important to put that brutality on screen to make sure that we don't forget what these people have gone through? Absolutely. Absolutely. But we must also find new ways to express the horror and injustice of the deed. The scope of value always seems so narrow. Where are the explorations of our humanity, our love for one another as families, you know, traditions that we pass down, the ways we took care of our children, the customs that we clung to, even in the bowels of a slave ship by braiding each other's hair with beads. The realities of what it was like for gay and queer slaves because they did exist and I can assure you that black women were not the only people who were victims of rape and sexual violence on plantations. I have loved getting to read books about these topics and learning so much about all of these aspects of black enslaved folks lives. But I'm also in a very privileged position where A, I can afford to buy some of these books which are expensive, and B, I enjoy reading them. Part of the reason why there's so much ignorance on like diaspora Twitter is because we are always kind of being taught that these things are different, that we're being taught that there is shame in these experiences. I feel very proud and I feel more proud the more I learn. I can't say that I'm over movies about slavery because there are not many good movies about slavery. So many of them fail to really appreciate the scope and pain of what that experience was. What I am tired of is the only way that we can tell those stories is by framing the trauma as the only thing that gives value to these stories. When the true value for me is that these human beings lived. We don't have many great movies about the Reconstruction era and how so many different black folk try to find each other and build up their families. We don't have stories about the way that black mothers try to protect their children from slavery. The closest we have is Beloved. And apparently people didn't see that movie when it came out. I wasn't born yet, so it's not my fault. But you know, we haven't even touched the beginning of the scope. And even when we do touch on it, there are many people who are left behind. In the Royal Shakespeare Company, there are only 33 actors that have their names engraved on these this bronze plate. And the only person of African descent who is on that plaque is a man named Ira Frederick Aldridge. And he is like this, has this amazing story of being this successful Shakespearean black actor from like the 1800s who like performed for Queen Victoria and was this renowned Shakespearean actor who had a huge career in Britain and in Europe. And it's like, where's that story? Where's that story? There are so many lived lives that have experienced the joy and pain and have, and have just done so many things. We cannot allow the fact that we are only taught so much about our experiences to make us think that that is all that we have. I'm back! Okay, so for the giveaway, my desire is that for the month of October and hopefully for most of my big videos going forward, I will be able to give something back to my subscribers and fans who have helped me. And for me as a reader, as someone who's really invested in literature and Black diasporic learning, what I want to do is definitely give back to those communities as well. And so for my giveaway, I am giving away three books. One for, will be for a patron, one will be for someone who comments on YouTube, and one will be for someone on Twitter. After you watch this video, because you'll know then, uh, just send me an email to the address I have down below in the description box with your first, second, and third choices, and I will pick 
uh, a person by random from each platform. And the three books that I am going to be giving away are Black on Both Sides, Wicked Flesh, Black Women Intimacy and Freedom in the Atlantic World, stamped out, stamped from the beginning, the definitive history of racist ideas in America. Please do not submit twice. I want to make sure everyone gets a fair chance. And yeah. <laughs> Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Please don't watch Antebellum. <laughs> it is not good. And uh, like I said, I'll list down below some great movies to watch. And yeah, I think that it's just frustrating that we have so little access to things. And sometimes, you know, it is kind of an elitist institution. There are so many movies that I have found out about, you know, black you know, relationships that I found out not because I had heard of them growing up, but because I follow a lot of really great people on YouTube in different places that really are invested in making sure that their work is intersectional and therefore they put in that effort. But if it wasn't for them, there's so much I wouldn't have had instant access to and able to find these things out. So yeah.